Committee uh, will come to order. I want to uh, thank our witnesses uh, for joining us here today and for their service to the American people. Your agencies and offices are, are vital to protecting federal cyber networks and critical infrastructure systems. And although it can often be uh, difficult to understand the complexity and the severity of many cyber attacks, they are only increasing in sophistication and frequency and have a significant cost to our national security. The Federal Bureau of Investigation reported that there were 2,474 ransomware attacks in 2020, though experts believe that that number is actually much, much higher. Just last month in my home state of Michigan, about 1,500 patients were, were notified that their information had been exposed as a result of the breach of file sharing service used by their hospital. This breach, like the SolarWinds attack, is yet another example of how our adversaries target vendors and contractors, including small businesses, to find the weakest link and exploit our greatest vulnerabilities. In order to prevent these types of attacks, potential victims from the public sector to the private sector must be aware of these ever-changing threats and have the right information to safeguard their networks. Whether it's widespread spyware or a ransomware attack, the federal government needs to know when cyber incidents have occurred so that they can determine if there are patterns, also future potential targets, and help seal up vulnerabilities. This information is especially vital when it comes to our nation's critical infrastructure, 85% of which is privately owned and operated. Despite this vulnerability, there's currently no national requirement for all critical infrastructure owners and operators to report to the federal government when they have been hit with a significant attack. And that needs to change. As we have seen from recent attacks on an oil pipeline, water treatment plants, food processing facilities, and hospitals, these breaches can cause serious economic and national security concerns and disrupt our daily lives. If multiple critical infrastructure entities, like energy companies, for example, are reporting similar attacks, then CISA and other federal agencies should be able to warn others, prepare for potential impacts to that sector or other related sectors, and help prevent further widespread attacks. Ranking member Portman and I are currently working on legislation that we plan to introduce soon to require critical infrastructure companies to ex experience, that experience cyber incidents and other entities that make ransomware payments to report this information to CISA. This requirement will ensure CISA and other federal officials have better situational awareness of ongoing cybersecurity threats, who those targets are, how the adversary is operating, and how best to protect the nation. I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how an incident reporting law could help each of your organizations assist victims in recovering from an attack and prevent them from happening in the first place. But we also need to ensure the federal government is sharing this same information in a timely manner. The last time Congress substantially addressed federal cybersecurity was in 2014, when this committee, led by then Chairman Carper, passed the Federal Information Security Modernization Act. Since then, our technology has developed rapidly, along with the sophisticated threats that we face. When that legislation was passed, CISA had not yet even been created. We need to pass updated legislation that clarifies CISA's roles and responsibilities in federal information security, improve how incidents on federal ne uh, networks are being reported to Congress, and ensure that our own cybersecurity resources are effectively aligned with emerging threats. Ranking Member Portman and I are also working on legislation that would help achieve these goals. We also need a better understanding of how the federal government is balancing its responsibility to bring cyber criminals to justice and helping victims recover from attack. We learned earlier this week that in one instance, the FBI withheld a digital key that could have aided victims for several weeks to pursue an investigation. 
In order to conduct a thorough oversight, this committee needs to know more about the federal government's process for assisting the victims of an attack and how your agencies will weigh investigative, national security, and economic needs. Finally, I want to acknowledge the important actions the Biden administration has already taken to bolster our cybersecurity defenses, improve information sharing, and apply the lessons learned from previous breaches to future attacks. The President's executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity, for example, is paramount to securing our nation. This is a top priority for myself and Ranking Member Portman, and I look forward to today's discussion and working productively with these vital federal, federal agencies to ensure that we are addressing this threat. Ranking Member Portman, you're now recognized for your opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for convening this critically important hearing. Uh, I look forward to the dialogue, and um, it's great to have people in place who are uh, now in charge of our uh, cybersecurity system at the federal government level. Um, our strategy for protecting our cyber networks and our critical infrastructure is uh, something that we've been struggling with, frankly, and uh, to have the, uh, the leadership in place is very important to get that strategy right. One important part of it, in my view, is accountability. And I hope to have a conversation uh, about the appropriate roles and responsibilities for the many different cybersecurity positions within the federal government. You know, who's in charge? Who's making the decisions? Who's accountable? I also look forward to discussing how cyber incident reporting legislation might better inform that strategy. As the chairman has just said, I think that's very important. And I think we can get that right. I think we can get a bipartisan uh, product on that. In recent years, hostile cyber adversaries, both foreign and domestic, have executed some of our most damaging cyber attacks ever, and we all know about these. Uh, we've had hearings about them, um, Colonial Pipeline most recently. Both the federal government and the private sector companies have been targeted. We held hearings uh, on Solar Winds, uh, uh, Colonial Pipeline, and others. These events are stark reminders of the wide-ranging and real-world impacts of sophisticated cyber attacks, and impacts on people. These attacks um, have become more and more common, um, and so it's important that we work to protect ourselves and our networks. One of the best strategies for preventing these attacks, of course, is to improve baseline cybersecurity practices, basic cyber hygiene. We also know that federal agencies have failed to make meaningful progress on the implementation of these practices, as is actually required by law under FISMA, the Federal Information Security Modernization Act. In August, uh, just last month, Chairman Peters and I released a report detailing the significant cybersecurity vulnerabilities of eight key federal agencies, Department of Homeland Security, State, Transportation, Housing, Health and Human Services, Ag, Education, and Social Security. This report follows a 2019 report I released with Senator Carper as chair of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, evaluating the same eight agencies. In this year's report, only DHS, Department of Homeland Security, had an effective cybersecurity program. Every other agency featured in the report failed to meet the standard. We also found that the average grade across all government agencies was a C minus, uh, close to failing. The report identifies several common agency vulnerabilities, including the failure to adequately protect personally identifiable information, maintain an accurate and up-to-date list of the agency's IT assets, install security patches in a timely fashion, and retire vulnerable legacy technology that is no longer secure. Securing fragmented networks against increasingly sophisticated attackers is not an easy or trivial task. It would be unfair to suggest otherwise. Yet. In nearly seven years since FISMA was last updated in 2014, agencies still have the same vulnerabilities year after year. Accountability is a critical aspect of any strategy. All three witnesses with us here today have heard me discuss the importance of it for federal cybersecurity in particular. At all of your confirmation hearings and in our conversations, we talked about the need to ensure that we have appropriate accountability for these federal networks and the agency systems. Among the three of you and the Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber, I believe we will continue to see these inconsistencies or um, vulnerabilities because of the question about accountability, unless we're clear about who's in charge. Who's in charge to better prevent? Who's in charge to better respond to cyber attacks? I look forward to continuing that discussion today, again, of how we can best achieve that accountability. 
We're also here to discuss this topic of uh, overarching strategy and particularly cyber incident reporting. As I said, recent attacks on critical infrastructure, particularly through ransomware, demonstrated how prompt notification to the government can benefit both the government and its victims. In the case of Colonial Pipeline, the FBI was able to recover part of the ransom paid by Colonial to the attackers. There is a balance between getting information quickly, letting victims respond to an attack without imposing onerous requirements on them, and getting accurate information. We understand that balance, and we want to try to reach the right balance to be sure that we are actually doing what we intend to do, which is to both help the private sector and government agencies um, deal with cyber attacks. I look forward to the witnesses' perspective on how to balance those competing priorities. Again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the witnesses being here today. Glad you're in place, and I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Portman. It's the practice of uh, this committee to swear in witnesses, so if uh, each of you would please stand and uh, raise your right hands. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, uh, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? You may be seated. Our first witness today is National Security Director Chris Inglis. Director Inglis has over 41 years of federal service and has held a variety of senior leadership assignments at the Department of Defense and the National Security Agency. He initially began his career at NSA as a computer scientist within the National Computer Security Center, eventually serving seven and a half years as a senior civilian and deputy director. His work included tours in information assurance, policy, time-sensitive operations, and signal intelligence operations. In addition to his civilian work, Mr. Inglis' uh, military career includes over 30 years of service in the U.S. Air Force, nine years on active duty, and 21 years in the Air National Guard, from which he retired as a brigadier general in 2006. Mr. Inglis, thank you for all of your service to the American people. Uh, I know this is the, uh, the first time you have come before this committee uh, since your confirmation, and we expect you will be here many times uh, in, the, in the time ahead. So welcome. You may uh, proceed with your opening comments. Thank you, sir, as do I. Uh, with your permission, I'll remove my mask for the duration of my remarks. Certainly. Thank you. Um, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, distinguished members of the committee and staff, Thank you for the privilege to appear before you today and the honor to appear alongside Director Easterly and Mr. DeRussia. I'm eager to update you on the Biden-Harris administration's progress in standing up the new office of the National Cyber Director and to discuss the administration's approach to cybersecurity. I'm mindful of the history of this moment. I'm appearing before you as the first National Cyber Director, a position that you created just last year and confirmed me for following my nomination by President Biden. I'm grateful for the confidence that the President and the Congress have placed in this role, for the opportunity to bring it to fruition, and for the cybersecurity and critical infrastructure investments that you have made and are proposing in follow-on vehicles like the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. I remain committed to engaging with you as we take on these critical shared imperatives. To that end, I'm pleased to tell you that the Office of the National Cyber Director is making progress in standing up as a full-fledged contributor to the various initiatives we will discuss today. And while we are anxious to receive appropriations needed to implement our strategy fully, no resource in this business is more valuable than our people. As you well realize, cyber talent is in high demand everywhere. But we're pleased with the quality and the experience of the people we have recruited thus far, and we will continue to work with Congress to secure the resources we need to bring on key staff. In the coming months, I expect our contribution from the Office of the National Cyber Director to the President's cybersecurity agenda to grow and focus on a few key challenges accountability and follow and follow through on the implementation of cybersecurity policy and investments, securing technology supply chains and the broader cyber ecosystem, fostering collaboration across the public and private sectors, coordinating closely with OMB and CISA on the security, resilience, and coherence of the federal network enterprise and ensuring defensive cyber operations and planning are equipped and postured for success. I will also be working with my colleagues to continue implementing crucial initiatives directed by President Biden, including working with my counterparts on the implementation of Executive Order 14028 on improving the nation's cybersecurity, initiatives to strengthen and proactively defend critical infrastructure cybersecurity, and the central challenge of building a cyber workforce to meet our needs well into the future. 
To these ends, the Office of the National Cyber Director will endeavor to drive the federal government's efforts through the following priorities. First, the Office will champion coherence across the federal cyber enterprise, ensuring we speak with one voice and, more importantly, operate with unity of purpose and effort. Second, we will zero in on improving public-private collaboration, supporting and building on the work of CISA and others. Third, we will carefully analyze the cyber maturity of federal agencies and chart a path, a path for ambitious cybersecurity goals against which the U.S. government can effectively execute. We look forward to close partnership with OMB to align resources and authorities together with these ambitions. Finally, the office will work to increase present and future resilience, not only within the federal government, but across the American digital ecosystem. That's a big task for which we've started by exercising incident response and planning processes from which we already have learned much regarding how to evolve those processes into the future. Through these and other efforts, we are working to ensure that our workforce, our technologies, our organizations, and our relationships are not only fine-tuned for today's needs, but are future-proofed for service in an ever-changing world. These are daunting undertakings. While the Office of the National Cyber Director is young and small, once expected funding is in place, and with the partners we have today, along with the support of Congress, it will be in a strong position to succeed in delivering the expected returns. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Inglis. Our next witness is uh, Gene Easterly, uh, Director of the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, and Infrastructure Security Agency. As directed, Ms. Easterly, Ms. Easterly leads CISA's efforts to protect and defend the security of the nation's cyber and physical infrastructure. Ms. Easterly has an established record of public service, including two tours at the White House, most recently a special assistant to President Obama and senior director for counterterrorism, and previously as executive assistant to National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice in the George W. Bush administration. She is a veteran of the United States Army with more than 20 years of service in intelligence and cyber operations, including tours of duty in Haiti, the Balkans, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Ms. Easterly, I know this is also your first time. You have been uh, before this committee since your confirmation, and we expect to see you here on numerous occasions uh, in, the, in the time ahead as well. So welcome. Thank you for your service. You may proceed with your opening Thank comments. You. Thank you, Chairman. I look forward to it. Uh, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, distinguished members of the committee, thanks for the opportunity to testify on behalf of CISA on what I believe is the most important national security imperative, our nation's cyber defense. I'm grateful for your trust in confirming me to this position, and as I've shared with my team on each of my first 73 days in, in this office, I have the best job in government. As I always say, cybersecurity is a team sport, so I'm truly honored to testify today alongside Chris Inglis and Chris Duresha, my teammates and partners in cyber defense. I've spent the past two and a half months getting to know my teammates within CISA and engaging with partners across the federal government, at the state and local level, in private industry, and across the globe. Based on those observations, I want to outline my priorities for CISA and thoughts for how to move forward collectively to raise our cybersecurity baseline. As the director of CISA, I'm focused on building our workforce, strengthening the resilience of our federal civilian enterprise, and elevating the security of our nation's cyber ecosystem. First, people are CISA's number one asset, and I'm intently focused on making CISA the world's premier cyber and infrastructure defense agency, the place where the best network defenders want to work. When I arrived at CISA, I found a dedicated, innovative, and inspiring team. I intend to expand upon that foundation to build a culture of excellence and a talent management ecosystem that prizes teamwork and collaboration, innovation and inclusion, trust and transparency, ownership and empowerment. I'm equally focused on building a workforce that reflects the diversity of our nation, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's the smart thing to do. Diversity of experience, background, and thought enables better problem solving. Incidents like solar winds and colonial pipeline, JBS foods, and the scourge of ransomware attacks that you mentioned on our schools and hospitals and small businesses illustrate how cyber security impacts our daily lives. They also highlight the need to address shared cybersecurity risk, and it truly is shared. 
Together, we have to focus on strengthening our cyber defenses, investing in new capabilities, and fundamentally reimagining how we think about cybersecurity for the nation. To that end, CIS is pursuing capabilities that increase visibility into cybersecurity risks across federal agencies and critical infrastructure. One such capability, Cyber Sentry, uh, helps identify sophisticated threats to critical networks. We're excited about the results from the pilot and appreciate Congress's efforts to fully resource it. CISA as an agency, as you know, was designed to be something different and special, built on the foundation of collaboration with partnerships at the core of our mission. Recognizing that no single entity has all the answers, my goal is to shift the paradigm, transform public-private partnerships into operational collaboration, transform information sharing into information enabling, making sure that the data we deliver to network defenders is timely, relevant, and most importantly, actionable. We're gonna do this in part through the newly established Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, and I wanna thank you for authorizing it. JCDC harnesses the power of the federal cyber ecosystem and the private sector to create a common operating picture. It, our goal is to be able to see the dots, to connect the dots, and then to drive action to enable collective defense. All of these efforts align with the imperatives, imperatives conveyed in the president's executive order, as you mentioned, as well as uh, the last year's NDAA. Uh, at, they seek to further CIS's implementation of those requirements, and with respect to the EO in particular, I'm pleased to note that CIS has fully met the highly aggressive deadlines for each of the 35 unique implementation efforts we were charged to lead. That said, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and we need Congress's help. As you know, there's no single mandatory federal requirement for the reporting of cyber incidents, and without timely notification to CISA, critical analysis, mitigation guidance, and information sharing is severely delayed, leaving infrastructure vulnerable. Incident reporting must be timely, broad-based, and not limited by incident type or sector impacted. It also has to provide enforcement mechanisms to drive compliance. Finally, legislation should provide CISA with the flexibility to define the scope of requirements in consultation with our partners, including importantly, DOJ and FBI, balancing the benefit of reporting against the burdens to industry and government. Finally, I'd like to thank the committee for the efforts on FISMA reform. As you said, FISMA is outdated. The status quo clearly is not working. A modernized FISMA should shift the spotlight from compliance and box checking to true uh, risk management. It also should recognize and codify CIS's role as the operational lead for federal cybersecurity. As these efforts uh, move forward, I really look forward to working with the committee and our partners on it, hugely important. Our nation faces an unprecedented array of cyber risk. Now is the time to act, to deepen our collaboration, to strengthen our ability to defend the government's network, to drive targeted action. We must address this risk collectively to defend today and secure tomorrow. Thanks for the opportunity to appear before you. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, uh, Director Easterly. Thank you for being here. Our final uh, witness is uh, Chris uh, DeRussia. Mr. DeRussia has broad experience managing cybersecurity and critical infrastructure programs, plans, and operations in both the federal government uh, and private sector. He has held roles at the Department of Homeland Security and at the White House, where he served as senior cybersecurity advisor in the Obama administration. He also previously served as the state of Michigan's chief information security officer. Mr. DeRussia, as uh, the Federal Chief Information Security Officer, you're charged with implementing and coordinating many of the efforts uh, that we will be discussing here today. And based on your strong record in my home state of Michigan and your extensive experience, I have every confidence uh, that you're up to this challenging task. Welcome, Mr. DeRussia. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Well, thank you, Chairman Peters and Ranking Member Portman, distinguished members of the committee. Um, thank you for the invitation to testify about the administration's cybersecurity priorities. I'm pleased to be here today with Directors Easterly and Inglis. The three of us work closely together in service of a common mission to build a more secure federal enterprise. This committee took decisive action earlier this year by supporting $1 billion in emergency funding to the Technology Modernization Fund. I'd like to provide a brief update. To date, we have received more than 100 project proposals requesting over $2.3 billion. 75% of those proposals are focused on cybersecurity improvements. The need is clear. 
As the board prepares to release its first round of awards for this emergency funding, we are focused on learning what works well for one agency and translating that into successful outcomes for all. These are challenging times to manage cybersecurity for any enterprise. It is not the time for us to maintain a steady course. We need to embrace bold ideas. We need to form enduring partnerships. And above all, we must act with a sense of urgency. I'd like to now highlight three areas of focus where the administration is taking decisive action on federal cybersecurity. The first is zero trust. Earlier this month, we released for public comment a draft strategy to move the US government towards zero trust principles. This term, zero trust, refers to a security model where every person, device, and network is considered untrusted and potentially compromised. This is a significant shift from the traditional model we have used throughout public and private sector. We have proposed an ambitious multi-year plan that establishes a new baseline for government security and will require us to iterate and adjust over time. Our strategy directs agencies to adopt known trusted technologies and practices that make it harder for even sophisticated adversaries to defeat our defenses. The approach is purposeful and specific, yet flexible for agencies to learn and adjust along the way. OMB will require agencies to develop funding and implementation plans to demonstrate early iterative progress and most importantly to work together as one community in implementation. The second area I'd like to highlight is the executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. In May, the president issued executive order 14028 with the intent of dramatically improving the nation's cybersecurity by deploying critical capabilities government-wide, by improving information sharing between the US government and the private sector, and by strengthening the United States' ability to respond to incidents when they do occur. We recently passed the 120-day milestone since the EO was issued. Over that time, OMB, NSC, and now the NCD have been working closely with agencies to execute key deliverables, which include a definition of critical software, as well as accompanying security guidance from NIST, the recommendation of new contract clauses that will enhance how the federal government and industry work together to address cyber threats, OMB memoranda to help agencies identify and secure their most critical software, and set requirements for storing and sharing security data to support incident detection and response activities. And finally, as I just described a moment ago, a draft zero trust strategy and key supporting technical guidance developed by CISA designed to raise the security baseline of the entire federal civilian government. The final area I'd like to highlight is FISMA reform. The Federal Information Security Modernization Act of 2014, or FISMA, describes the roles and responsibilities that underpin much of the policy and oversight work that my office does today. We appreciate the opportunity to work with Congress on reforming this flagship piece of legislation to improve the government's ability to manage risk. We share Congress's view that we should be more clearly oriented towards security outcomes, and we're actively updating guidance to agencies in support of this goal. In conclusion, this administration is dedicated to making cybersecurity the immediate priority in federal IT. Since January, we've been balancing a national response to a series of significant cyber events while laying the strategic groundwork for the future. As we move forward, we are focused on supporting agencies as they work to implement these priorities with diligence and that sense of urgency. As I've said today, none of us can do this alone. It is a partnership where collaboration is key with my colleagues here today, but more importantly, with the personnel across federal government that work tirelessly every day to safeguard our nation's digital assets. I appreciate this committee's leadership in this field. And I'm confident that through partnership and frank discussions, we're gonna build a more secure and resilient federal, federal enterprise together. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeRussia. All, all of you are, are, are well aware uh, that Ranking Member Portman and I are working together on an incident reporting bill that would require specific companies to report to CISA regarding cyber intrusions and when they make uh, ransomware payments uh, as well. Certainly after thousands of cyber attacks, including uh, Solar Winds, the Microsoft Exchange, and the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, it's, uh, I think it's probably well past time 
uh, for us to have some sensible uh, legislation put forward to, to make sure that we're getting timely information about these um, incidents. My first question is uh, for Director Easterly. Uh, if, if our incident reporting bill were enacted, what would CIS uh, do with this information and, and how would you be able to help victims? Thanks very much for your question, Chairman. First of all, we really appreciate this effort. We absolutely agree it's long past time to get cyber incident reporting uh, legislation out there and we're excited to work with you on this. Uh, CIS has, uh, plays a critical role uh, as the National Coordinator for Critical Infrastructure Resilience and Security. As I think about uh, CISA's superpower that we use on behalf of the nation and the American people is our ability to share information rapidly to enable us to protect other potential victims. So what we could do with this information is not only render assistance to the victim and help them remediate uh, and recover uh, from the attack, but we could use that information, we could analyze it, and then we could share it broadly to see whether, in fact, uh, evidence of such intrusions were found across the sector or, frankly, across other sectors or across the federal civilian executive branch. So we think uh, that timely and relevant importing is at reporting of cyber incidents is absolutely critical to help us raise the baseline and protect the cyber ecosystem. Strangless, my next question uh, is uh, for you. Uh, with, the, with the type of uh, information being collected uh, by, by CISA as laid out uh, in the draft legislation that we're working on, help uh, NCD formulate a national strategy uh, and develop policies to prevent these attacks from happening in the first place? Clearly, we want to be a deterrent for them to occur. Uh, would this be helpful? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. I wholeheartedly support what Director Easterly just uh, said and do believe that information would be profoundly useful for the determination of an appropriate strategy. Um, to reprise, that information is useful to help us be more efficient and to prioritize our response in the moment, to inform investments that we should make to get left of the event to prevent these from happening in the future, and ultimately as a foundation of true knowledge, factual-based knowledge, such that we can create strategies that cover the gamut of cybersecurity activities. Mr. DeRussia, the, the incident reporting data from uh, the bill that we're talking about, as well as uh, a FIMSA reform bill that we're also working together on, would help protect uh, federal networks by indicating when intrusions uh, have occurred on both private and government-owned uh, systems, much like we saw after FireEye announced the, uh, the solar wind uh, attack. Is there anything else uh, from the OMB's perspective that we should consider uh, as we're developing uh, the text uh, in both of these bills? Well, Senator, I, I believe it's crucial that uh, federal civilian agencies are included. Uh, we, we need to ensure that we have one common standard that everyone is following. Uh, that, that has been my experience, both the state and federal level, that uh, there's, a, there's a patchwork of reporting requirements and they need to come together. Uh, it's overly burdensome and we're not focused on the right security outcomes. Um, the, the, the other thing I'd say, though, is we have a really good partnership with CISA sharing threat information in a timely way <clears throat> to federal agencies. And what, what we need is we need to increase the pipeline of information and, and get it in faster. So, so those are the things that I'd be really focused on. The next question uh, for all three of you, and I'll start with you, uh, uh, Director Easterly. We'll go the same order that, I, uh, that I, uh, we just went through. You, each of you uh, has a lot of experience in the private sector, and, and part of what we are looking at here is mandating uh, companies to submit these uh, reports, but uh, we have to make sure they actually comply uh, with that to get this information. So I'd, be, I'd love to hear your thoughts, and the committee would love to hear your thoughts on uh, the right enforcement mechanism uh, to make sure that that information actually gets submitted. What should we be focused on? Director Easterly. Yeah, thanks for the question, Chairman. You know, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, I do think a compliance and enforcement mechanism is very important here. Uh, I know some of the language talks about a subpoena authority. Uh, my personal view is that is not an agile uh, enough mechanism to allow us to get the information that we need to share it as rapidly as possible to prevent other uh, potential victims uh, from threat actors. So I think that we should look at fines. Fines are obviously used across industries. I just came from four and a half years in the financial services sector uh, where fines are a mechanism uh, that ena enable compliance and enforcement. I realize this is a complicated issue. 
Uh, and I really look forward to working through it with you because I think it is important that we are able to get the information that we need in a timely way. Thank you, Mr. Inglis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I support uh, that view strongly. Um, I would observe that uh, most of the 50 states have uh, reporting uh, requirements of a similar sort, and the vast majority of those have an enforcement mechanism. Many of those use fines. And there may be some best practices in there if we do a thoughtful survey of how they've actually addressed this and how that has worked and whether that has imposed an unfair burden on the victims. We, of course, don't want to impose um, a, an unfair burden on the victims. But this information is essential for the welfare of the whole. There should be rewards for good behavior. If you, if you performed well and thoughtfully in this, the benefit should be obvious, which is that we can provide better services, both in response and in preventing this in the future. Mr. De Russia. Uh, yes, Senator. Uh, also agree enforcement is needed and share the views of my colleagues and we'll be happy to work with uh, this committee. Thank you. Uh, uh, before I recognize uh, Senator Carper uh, for his questions, uh, I need to step uh, aside uh, and attend another committee. As you can see from attendance, we have committees. We're actually in the middle of a vote, so members will be coming and going uh, as this, uh, as this uh, hearing uh, continues. But Maggie, or Senator Hassan will uh, chair in my absence. Uh, but as I leave, uh, Senator Carper, you're recognized for your questions. Uh, Sir Pierce, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, it's great. I can hear you too. Uh, well, uh, welcome to uh, to all of our uh, our witnesses uh, today. Thank you for your your leadership and what you do with your with your lives. Uh, my my first question is for uh, Director Inglis. And uh, have I pronounced your right name correctly, Director Inglis? Inglis, is that right? Yes, sir. Precisely correct. Thank you. That's great. Uh, I have. Uh, Worked uh, with colleagues, uh, not just Democrats, but uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle for many years on federal data security and breach uh, notification legislation that would protect the consumers' uh, sensitive for personal uh, information. Uh, as you know, uh, Director Inglis, uh, each state and, and as well as the District of Columbia and, and uh, several territories have some form uh, of their own uh, breach uh, notification law. There is, however, having said, there's no national standard. Back in 2019, while leading, uh, while I was privileged to lead the permanent subcommittee on, on investigation, Senator Portman and I released a, a report dealing, uh, detailing rather, Equifax uh, repeated failures to uh, protect sensitive information uh, for more than 145 million Americans, a lot of people. Uh, Director Inglis, uh, can uh, can you take just a moment to speak uh, to the importance of having federal data be breach standard uh, and whether or not it would help uh, covered entities have to have consistency in cyber best uh, practices and places to protect Americans' personal information? Um, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, as you may well know, the administration has no formal position on that at the moment, but I would observe the following, which is that given that 50 states have essentially addressed this, each one in their own way. Um, if you're a company that operates across those 50 states, you then have 50 challenges in terms of doing breach notification. Um, and, and I imagine that most of those companies are trying to get it exactly right, so they have to do it 50 times. To the degree that we can harmonize and standardize that essential requirement um, to provide the breach notification so that we can assure that the victims are properly notified and the recovery efforts address their needs at that moment of vulnerability, I think that federal legislation would be useful. All right. Thank you for those uh, for those comments. Uh, next, uh, uh, Jen Easterly, the director Easterly. How are you? I'm great, sir. How are you? Good. How are things at CISA? They're awesome. Best job in government. Ah, uh, it's good. Would you work for nothing? Yes, I almost do. All right. <laughs> well, we're, we're looking for ways to bring down the deficit. I'll pass that on. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as as we uh, seriously, as we saw from the colonial uh, pipeline. Ransomware attack uh, earlier this uh, this year. When a disaster strikes in the, the cyber world, folks don't always know uh, who who to call. Uh, in fact, uh, the CEO of Colonial Pipeline, I think his name Blount, Joseph uh, Blount, uh, was uh, was actually before a committee earlier this this year. Uh, he placed his first call. He told us he placed his first call to the FBI. The, the FBI then put him in touch with uh, with CISA. 
And this incident uh, makes, I think, uh, makes clear that we need a plan for, for who to contact when a cyber incident occurs, and we need to better communicate that plan with not just our federal uh, partners, but with state and, and private partners, too. Uh, Director Easterly, is there a clear and well-documented, uh, uh, well-communicated, rather, plan in place for the federal government and for critical infrastructure entities to um, implement should they be subject to a cyber, or in the case of colonial pipeline, to a, a ransomware attack? Thanks so much for the question. A hugely important issue. Call, it reminds me of Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call them? They're not around these days, so who are we going to call? <laughs> Uh, I think we're the new Ghostbusters, actually, uh, oh, sir. Yeah. Uh, so it's a hugely important question. And I would just say, you know, I watched the hearing uh, with Mr. Blunt from Colonial. And I, I think it was great uh, that FBI immediately reached out to CISO. We have a fabulous partnership with FBI. And that has only been confirmed uh, over my last uh, two and a half months how important and how strong that partnership is. But I think your point speaks to the larger issue and why this cyber incident uh, reporting legislation is so important because we need to get reports uh, both about uh, breach, as you were just talking to Director Inglis about, about ransomware, but really about uh, all flavors of cyber incident because it's very important for us to both be able to render assistance to any entity that suffers an attack, but to be able to analyze that information and to share it more widely because we know that in today's world, uh, everything is connected everything is interdependent, and thus everything is vulnerable. So, so having that information in a timely way so that CISA can share it both with our partners across the federal government, but importantly with our partners across critical infrastructure, and then of course at the state and local and tribal and territorial level, so that we can collectively raise the baseline of the cyber ecosystem. I think it's incredibly important to instantiate that in legislation, sir. I agree. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that response. I, I have a, a question as well, if, if time will allow, to ask of all three uh, witnesses. Start with you, uh, 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 Director. I would, uh, then we'll go to the other the other witnesses. But uh, as uh, as I believe you know, uh, each of you mentioned, I think, in your testimony, uh, in uh, May of 21, earlier this this year, President Biden signed an executive order aimed at strengthening our cybersecurity as well as our ability to respond to cyber incidents when they occur. Um, I'm pleased to see that we are shifting to a more uh, proactive as opposed to reactive posture in the, uh, the cyber security space. And uh, my, my question would be this for the three of you. Uh, to that end, could each of you take a moment to share with us how you are working in concert with one another to implement President Biden's executive order and what you need from Congress in order to implement these uh, changes? And uh, uh, Director Easter, why don't you go first? Great. Thanks so much, sir. Yeah, um, I agree. It was a very significant uh, executive order, and I think it will uh, really help make a difference for both the federal cyber ecosystem as well as the broader ecosystem. Uh, we have been working very closely with all of our partners, in particular our partners uh, with Federal CISO, with my good teammate Chris Darasha here and Chris Inglis, to make sure that we are implementing all of the tasks that were assigned to us. I think we had 35 total, uh, and we've met all the all the uh, uh, the deadlines to date. As you said, this is about a paradigm shift in how we protect the federal cyber ecosystem, improving information sharing uh, from federal contractors, modernizing the infrastructure to move to zero trust architecture, as Mr. DeRussia already talked about, making sure we have cloud secure instantiations, and then making sure that we're implementing uh, what we call EDR, or endpoint detection and response technology, which allows us to not just focus on the perimeter, but really to focus in depth all the way down to the host level, at the workstation, at the server, to ensure that we can uh, see what threats are out there, detect suspicious activity, and ensure that we're able to mitigate and remediate it as soon as possible. So those aspects of it, uh, plus all we're doing about secure software, software bill of materials, and then finally, everything we're doing to improve detection around logging. Uh, so a lot of work done. I, I look forward to keeping the committee updated, sir, on the important work. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, Mr. Rush, really the same question, how to uh, talk to us uh, a little bit about how... Senator, uh, Senator Carper, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask each witness to respond to your question, but you're you're over by about a minute, and so we need to move along. Okay, thank you. All right. I will yield. Thank you. 
Yeah, Senator, uh, yeah. look, it was a very large, aggressive action plan, which we felt uh, completely appropriate for the moment. We are focused and have made a lot of progress already on baseline hygiene measures. Um, the director recently just described some of those. We've also set in place a multi-year strategy and plan. And you know what, we, what we're gonna need from Congress is, uh, you know, we're gonna need some new resources to implement this plan. But what we've done is we've really laid out in pretty descriptive detail what we need to do to become more secure as a federal enterprise. And so we really look forward to working with Congress on those priorities. And Senator, I'll answer quickly. Um, largely in agreement with all of those remarks. Um, I, I was impressed with the audacity of the plan, I'm very aggressive. I'm pleased with the performance. We have met or exceeded the objectives that were established. I'm sobered by the idea that it's simply a down payment. And to Mr. DeRusha's point, we, we have much more work to do and we therefore need to redouble our efforts to do that. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Senator Carper. Uh, because Senator Portman isn't back yet, um, I'm going to recognize myself for a round of questions. And I want to thank Chair Peters and, and uh, the ranking member for um, this hearing. And I also want to thank the three of you not only for your service, but for your testimony today and your commitment to improving the country's cybersecurity. Um, my first question goes to Directors Easterly and Inglis. Um, and I'll start with Director Easterly. Um, one of the biggest impediments to improving cybersecurity is the shortage of qualified cybersecurity professionals at a federal, state, and local level. So I've introduced, along with Senator Cornyn, the Bipartisan Federal Cybersecurity Workforce Expansion Act. The act would authorize a registered cybersecurity apprenticeship program at uh, CISA, and it would also create a veteran cybersecurity training program at the Department of Veterans Affairs. So, Director Easterly, how would an apprenticeship program help address workforce challenges at CISA? Thanks for the question. Uh, I love that. I love apprenticeships. We've already started talking about how we could implement apprenticeships at CISA. I would love to work with you on that legislation. I think we need to be as creative as possible in all our approaches to deal with the deficit that we have across the country and then across the federal cyber workforce. So programs like rotational programs, apprenticeships, internships, uh, and I'm very excited in particular about implementing our cyber talent management system, finally, to enable us to more flexibly uh, hire people from, uh, from all walks of life, uh, at, basically based on their aptitude, not based on certifications or degrees. So uh, anything to do with workforce, Senator, I would love to work with you and your team in this committee. Great, I would look forward to that. Director Inglis, uh, what do you think of cyber apprenticeships and a veterans training program, and are there other ways we can increase the talent pipeline to build a larger cybersecurity workforce? Uh, Senator, once again, I'm in that position where happily I agree strongly with uh, both, both the premise that you've established and uh, Director Easterly's remarks. I think apprenticeships are essential, uh, not simply because they provide um, experience for its own sake, but they bridge the gap between aspiration that is often supported by training and education and the real experience that employers need or want when you show up at that door. It, and it helps to transition from one phase to another in terms of one's um, work life. Um, to the extent that that's something we can pilot um, at CISA or within the Veterans Administration or other places, I, I would hope that we make that broadly available to the rest of government. Yeah. As to what else we can do, I think that it falls into three broad buckets which are not unrelated. We need to increase awareness um, so that every citizen, every person who kind of experiences cyberspace has what's necessary to cross the digital cyber street in the same way that we teach children to cross actual streets, yep. and that they're aware of the opportunities in this space. We need to make sure that we invest some more training and education in those who make decisions that implicate cybersecurity, but they don't know it, whether they're lawyers or logisticians or system right. engineers. And then, of course, we need to double down on filling the jobs that have cyber and IT in their job title, but we need to be as broad-based as possible, to Ms. Easterly's point. We need to encourage diversity because that's a mission essential strength. Uh, but at the same time, let's relook those job skills to make sure we're asking for the right things. You don't need a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science for every one of those jobs. Thank you very much. Um, Director Easterly, uh, the Office of Management and Budget recently released a draft zero trust strategy, and it was nice to hear Mr. Russia talk about it. It states that the continuous diagnostics and mitigation or CDM program run by CISA is a foundational element of the federal government's cybersecurity. I introduced legislation with Senator Corn in last Congress to codify the program, and we're working on reintroducing CDM legislation this Congress. 
When do you expect all civilian federal agencies to have their electronic assets inventoried and continuously monitored, monitored via CDM? Thanks for the question. Uh, it's a great one. And having a lot of experience in this space and certainly uh, in the private sector, asset inventories and ensuring that you know exactly what's in your network is not a trivial uh, endeavor. Uh, all that said, uh, I'm told that we're at about 85% of an understanding of the federal endpoints. And so I think we will get there in the near term, and I'm happy to keep you updated on the course of our progress. Okay, and a related issue, of course, is whether CISA is reevaluating previously approved CDM tools to ensure that they still meet the newest best practices and our, and our zero trust strategy. So is that happening as well? Yes, ma'am, absolutely, as part of our entire modernization effort to make sure that we are able to provision the right capabilities through the CDM program. And some of the most important ones, as you're aware of, are our EDR capabilities, yeah. the endpoint detection and response. Okay. Um, another question for you, Director Easterly. Next week, I'm going to lead a subcommittee hearing on the federal government's IT management resources, the services available to agencies to modernize their aging systems and ways to improve those programs while also saving taxpayers money. And Mr. DeRussia, I am looking forward to hearing from your colleague, Federal Chief Information Officer Claire Martirana, uh, on this topic. An important aspect of ensuring the cybersecurity of federal systems is modernizing outdated and obsolete IT systems, which are difficult, if not impossible, to properly secure. So, Director Easterly, how is CISA supporting agency efforts to modernize their aging IT systems to improve cybersecurity? We are taking a very aggressive approach because we understand the urgency here. Uh, that said, Senator, this is a very complex uh, endeavor dealing with years and years yeah. of legacy systems. It's why, as my colleague, Mr. DeRussia, mentioned, uh, the TMF fund right. uh, is so important to enable yeah. that modernization. So we are working hand-in-hand -hand with departments and agencies to ensure that they have the capabilities that they need to enable them to build out uh, networks in a different way. And it really goes to the zero-trust architecture uh, the secure cloud systems, the maturity model. Um, we're pushing as hard as we can, Senator. It's a big project, yeah. and it's really one of the reasons why I'm excited about FISMA reform, because we need to ensure that we can do this the right way and secure an enterprise, not 102 separate departments and agencies. Well, thank you. Uh, last question for you. Uh, I was delighted to hear your testimony and by the recent announcement from CISA about the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative or uh, JD, uh, let me make sure I have my acronym, JCDC. It's like ACDC. I know, yes, except yeah. not, but yes. Um, so it's intended to improve planning, information sharing, and collaboration among interagency, intergovernmental, and private sector partners. However, several of our critical infrastructure sectors, particularly the healthcare and education sectors, are severely under-resourced when it comes to cybersecurity, especially compared to the JCDC's initial private sector partners. Um, what lessons is CISA learning to learn from its initial industry collaborations that will help it and the JCDC support healthcare, education, and other sectors that are often under-resourced? And I see that I'm over time, so if you can make your answer brief, I can follow up with you as well. I'll do my best. Uh, the whole idea of those initial plank holders were those who had massive visibility so they could drive uh, action at scale, Senator. So the fact that we have the CSPs, the ISPs, the cybersecurity vendors that see the dots so we can connect them will allow us to have that information and provide it to the other critical infrastructure right. sectors so that we can help healthcare and education and all of the, what I would call, target-rich, sometimes resource-poor sectors. So they will accrue benefit from what we are building in the JCDC. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Portman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to start, if I could, by asking unanimous consent to put something in the record that has to do with reporting. Um, this is some of the feedback that we have received from industry and government with regard to our cyber notification legislation. Uh, I think the bill is better for this input, and I think it would be appropriate to have um, these letters included in the hearing record. All three relate uh, to the legislation. One is from uh, 18 trade associations, one is from the financial sector, one is from the communication sector, and the fourth is from the oil and gas sector, uh, expressing uh, their um, 
concerns in that case about uh, lack of consultation with the pipeline industry before issuing security directives. I would ask you to send these be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, let me start with something urgent. Um, I, I'm really eager to get to the accountability issue because, I, as you know, I think that's critical for us to be able to organize ourselves properly going forward. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we live in a state of constant uh, uh, attacks, and, and we just had another one. And uh, there's a joint publication by CISA, the FBI, and the Coast Guard last week that indicates uh, an advanced persistent threat, uh, meaning right now, timely, a threat um, targeting um, a software program used to authenticate users when they log onto their computers. And according to this publication, it's widely used by several critical infrastructure sectors, and the hackers um, have covered their tracks, much like we saw with, with solar winds. So, again, I would hope we could talk about the important, not just the urgent, but the urgent is upon us again. Uh, I would ask you, Ms. Easterly, can you briefly explain, you know, what this is and why it matters? Yeah, thanks very much for, for asking that question, Ranking Member Portman, because it does speak to, I think, a really good news story and the collaboration uh, and how we use data to help protect uh, other uh, sectors of critical infrastructure. So you're referring to something called Manage Engine AD Self-Service Plus, which is this uh, password management and single sign-on capability. Uh, we worked with the U.S. Coast Guard uh, on a vulnerability uh, at the Port of Houston and found out about this. We work with our FBI partners and our Coast Guard partners to better understand that vulnerability and then to be able to get that information out to see whether, in fact, we saw the same vulnerability across the federal cyber ecosystem and in our critical infrastructure partners. This was actually one of the early successes for JCDC because we were able to share that information across our JCDC partners to see if they could find additional uh, victims to notify. Uh, to this point we, in time, we see that the, uh, uh, the, the campaign thus far is limited, but we're continuing to work through it, and I'm happy to keep, keep you apprised. Well, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm glad to hear that, that you feel like in this case we have a handle on it. I did speak to one of your prominent JCDC members yesterday, and I support what you're doing there, and including bringing the private sector expertise in, and I think it's critically important. Um, the alert indicates that this advanced persistent threat uh, and these actors have been exploiting uh, vulnerabilities but also covering their tracks. What does that mean? And uh, does that mean if it's a nation state actor, as an example, we're not going to be able to determine who it is? Well, it, as you know, uh, Ranking Member Portman, attribution can always be complicated in terms of uh, being able to dispositively say who that threat actor is. Um, certainly the most sophisticated threat actors go to great lengths, as we saw with solar winds, to be able to cover their tracks and obfuscate their presence so that they can live for long times in, in networks and be able to extract data. Uh, but we are working very closely with our interagency partners and the uh, intelligence community to better understand this threat actor so that we can ensure that we are not only able to protect systems, but ultimately to be able to hold these actors accountable right. for, for and what In they terms do. of this one, can you tell us who you think it is? Uh, at this point in time, I would have to um, get back with my colleagues, but uh, I do think it is a nation state actor, sir. Concerning, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, well, we look forward to hearing more as you have it, uh, perhaps even in a classified setting to understand uh, what we can do to, uh, to be able to respond, as you say, to be able to push back yes, against sir. these nation state actors who continue to probe and um, to commit these crimes um, against our public and private sector entities, in this case, critical infrastructure. Okay, accountability. Um, I'm gonna show a chart here that uh, it, it, it is a chart that tries to explain what the roles are. And maybe it's just me, but it seems like there's a lot of overlapping responsibility, including, by the way, among the three of you. And the question is, you know, who's in charge? Who's accountable? We talked about this latest hack, um, and you mentioned uh, that you're involved uh, as the, um, you know, CISA lead, which is, which is good, but also you indicated that there are other entities involved, and the question is, you know, who's in charge uh, and who will take accountability as things happen? So this chart has, with regard to 
the strategic side, a national cyber director who's here with us today. Um, it has the deputy national security advisor who's been with us here before. Um, uh, she is not with us today, but she has a, a, a role that uh, she has indicated is um, in some ways quite similar to your role. Um, then we have OMB, of course, the federal CIO and the federal CISA role. Um, and then the CISA director and the FBI assistant director for cyber are more on the operational side. And then the strategic side, of course, every agency head has to be involved and should be. And then, of course, the agency CIOs and the CISOs and the agencies, um, and that goes to our FISMA issue we talked about earlier. So I, I guess what I would start with with you, Mr. Inglis, um, and again, I'm, I'm glad you're where you are. I wish you had more staff to be able to do your job, um, which is another topic we'll discuss. Under your authorizing statute, you are the principal advisor to the president on cybersecurity uh, and cybersecurity strategy. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And does that mean that you are the single point of accountability for federal cybersecurity within the executive branch? I think I am the single point of accountability for federal cybersecurity on owned or leased estates to include the federal government and the critical infrastructure. Uh, when we determine that we need to use instruments of power outside of owned or leased estates, the military, diplomacy, um, financial instruments of power, um, the National Security Council is the natural place to essentially coordinate those instruments of power and therefore they would, enact, they would interact to determine what that strategy should be to do the rest of what's required. But for purposes of preparation, synthesis of the big picture, defense of owned and leased estates, performance assessment, I am the accountable person. So are you accountable uh, as an example uh, if the Department of Homeland Security does not have proper um, cyber hygiene in place? Probably not a good example because they were one of the few agencies that we found of the eight uh, that was doing some of the right things, but let's say the Department of Health and Human Services or the Department of Energy, are you the one responsible? Yes, sir. I am ultimately the accountable person. Now, my job is to ensure that that accountability has been allocated properly to agency and department heads, um, to CISA for being you know, the operational entity coordinating the defense, to OMB for issuing the right directives. Um, as the coach, as we've used that term before, I need to ensure that those roles are properly assigned, properly executed, and ultimately to do performance assessments to ensure that we're meeting the need. And let, let me ask you this, um, this organizational chart, again, where um, we've talked about in the past the overlap, and you just talked about the, NS, uh, the National Security Council overlap with what you're doing. Do you think the federal government's organizational structure uh, is effective right now, and do you think that the, uh, the lines of responsibility are clear? I think it is reasonably effective. Can we make it better? We can, and we will. Um, the three of us at this table talk on a daily basis about how to actually ensure that these roles complement one another. I would observe that the chart, um, you've been generous, the chart does not show sector risk management agencies. Mm -hmm. That's a further complication of what they do on the edge of the enterprise that they represent. Um, all of those strengths represent diversity, which properly applied can be a huge strength for us. Um, it is perhaps then less um, complicated than the U.S. Department of Defense or an American football team, um, which if it has the right strategy, if it has the right roles, if the life forces that course across it create coherence, unity of purpose, unity of effort, it can in fact be quite useful. That's our job is to make sure that the video um, actually makes sense, even if the static picture does not. Mm -hmm. Well, you make the uh, football analogy. Um, there you have a, a coach who's ultimately responsible um, you have a quarterback responsible for the offense, um, and the question is how do you have that uh, with this more diffuse structure? Uh, is, is there any thought of issuing an executive order or some other rulemaking to more clearly delineate what the there, lines there of is, responsibility sir. I think that's, are? I think that's essential. Um, we're actually taking our time, not because we're complacent in any way, shape, or form, but taking our time to actually let experience, um, a, a modest amount of experience, drive our efforts to then clarify in writing um, what, what we believe is the right and proper way to describe that chart in action. Um, I, I think you would have hopefully seen over the last three or four months, there were several times when we reported um, informally to this committee, not on a major incident, but an incident we thought was reflective of the work that we do together 
um, where we surged to the point of need to assist an agency that was encountering some difficulty. We checked the rest of the enterprise, the federal enterprise in that case, to ensure that that had not been something experienced by others. We visited with the investment strategy using OMB resources to ensure that we were making the proper investments to get ahead of this and reworked that um, accordingly and then ensured that ultimately those best practices became something that everyone could benefit from. Um, that's complicated, that's hard to do, but it is the necessary work of the leadership that you've charged to undertake coherence in that diagram you have behind you. Well, let's, let's go to one of those points that you just made, which is uh, the cybersecurity budgets for the agencies. Uh, Mr. Derusha is here with us uh, on the panel, and, um, and you're here on the panel, yet both of you have that responsibility, as I understand it. Um, you have responsibility over the agency cybersecurity budgets and what they ought to be. Is that true, Mr. Derusha? Well, sir, OMB does, absolutely. So say it again. I'm sorry, sir. Yes, o OMB has a responsibility. It is a shared responsibility between the management side, but largely the, the budget side, the resource management officers. Okay, I don't want to put Mr. Inglis on the spot here, but would you agree with that, Mr. Inglis, that you don't have responsibility for cybersecurity budgets? I don't have unique and solitary authority over that. I, I agree. Not, not unique and solitary, but uh, Mr. Drosha just said that it's OMB who has unique and solitary uh, over, over that so, responsibility. And uh, my understanding is that, that you believe you have responsibility for it, too. Oh, no, sir, I don't. Uh, by statute, I have the uh, responsibility to report on performance. I don't have the authority to direct dollars. I don't have the authority to move dollars. But I think I have a useful um, and necessary function to report on performance. Um, I think by um, example, what we've done has actually joined those two um, responsibilities in a way that's coherent. Take the Technology Modernization Fund in hand. As uh, earlier described by Mr. DeRussia, there's a billion dollars allocated by the Congress for that purpose. There's $2.3 billion in applications. Uh, OMB, using its authority, has um, described what the requirements are that, that would allow them to judge the merits of any particular application. They've impaneled a board. Um, I have looked at those requirements. So I have judged that the panel is an appropriate panel to adjudicate this. And I look at each of the applications and each of the awards to ensure that they're consistent with our overall cyber strategy. I therefore am in a place where I am performing my responsibility to ensure performance at the same time allowing OMB to perform their statutory responsibility to be accountable for the budget. Uh, those two uh, nice, nicely, um, but in a complicated way, intersect at this thing we call cyber. I think that's by statute where we are. Um, we could possibly clarify that to a greater degree in the uh, FISMA modernization and other bills, but, but the things that I think that we're enjoying at the moment, we can achieve coherence with the roles as they are defined. Okay, well, I, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm over time already and I apologize to my colleagues. Let me just read the statute for what you're supposed to be doing. Reviewing the annual budget proposals for relevant federal agencies and departments and advising the heads of such departments and agencies whether such proposals are consistent with the national cyber policy and strategy. Sounds like you're involved in the budget. Um, but we look forward to further conversation, second round. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Parman. Uh, Senator Ossoff, uh, you are recognized uh, for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel. Thank you for your service. Um, Mr. DeRussia, you have responsibility as chair of the Federal Acquisition Security Council uh, for risk management in the supply chain for federal agencies. We just saw Apple rush out an iOS patch a couple of weeks ago, um, an exploit that allowed targeted remote jailbreaking of iOS devices, which uh, it appears had been outstanding for at least several months, had been used to target certain individuals, uh, was revealed. What's your assessment of your capabilities and the capabilities of the private sector partners you work with and your interagency partners at identifying zero-day exploits that could be used to target senior government executives by foreign intelligence services or um, to penetrate public sector or private sector networks? And um, what additional authorities or reforms to procedure or law might be contemplated to improve our ability to get ahead of that kind of exploit? Well, Senator, I'll, I'll respond first, but that is also a, a shared equity with this entire group, in particular at CISA, FBI, and other uh, partners. You know, I, I'll, I'll speak a little about the role of the FASC. You know, we are primarily focused on supply chain risks that have a nexus to national security um, uh, 
foreign threats and, and others. Um, so there is a, there's an acute focus of the FAST and its responsibilities. However, in, in, in our ability to make recommendation of exclusion or removal orders um, for the federal government. We also take on the responsibility strategically to ensure that we are providing the right guidance and risk information uh, to federal agencies. And so we're working on some new um, OMB guidance on that front. And we, we also uh, work closely with NIST to ensure that they have the appropriate understanding of the standards that sit behind the, the effective risk management programs that they need to build at each federal agency to, to secure itself. So it's a partnership there. And we have efforts um, to engage all of the key stakeholders, both industry and other committees like Team Telecom and, and the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. There's, there's a lot of groups and bodies that, that, are, that need to be pulled together to address the risks that you, that you described. Um, but also, you know, in particular to what you're talking about, um, you know, vu vulnerabilities of that sort are unfortunately fairly pervasive across the entire ecosystem. And, you know, that, that, that has not traditionally been the explicit focus of the FASC itself, um, but I'd be happy to have discussions re regarding that further. Okay, we'll come back to this topic in a moment. Uh, Mr. Inglis, I want to come to you for a moment and, and then hear from you, Ms. Isser, on this as well. What changes to policy or the operational posture of executive agencies have been made in response to lessons learned from the Colonial Pipeline breach? Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, in, in response to the Colonial Pipeline breach, what we've done is to shore up our response mechanisms. Ms. Easterly can talk at some length about that. Uh, we've engaged the CEOs of the pipeline sector to ensure that uh, they understand what the federal government is prepared to do, but at the same time, what we have an expectation of that they need to do in terms of increasing resilience and robustness, and they have responded in kind. Um, we have therefore um, kind of articulated what we believe the requirements are for the pipeline sector. We'll probably do that for other sectors as well. Um, worked closely with the private sector to make sure that that's understood and, and reasonable, um, and ultimately um, developed a response plan such that we can help them in the uh, moment of need in a way that's timely, efficient, and prioritized. Thank you. Ms. Easterly? Uh, yeah, I think as you know, uh, Senator, there were security directives that were issued in the wake of uh, the Colonial Pipeline incident. Uh, one of which importantly provides uh, the requirement to report cyber incidents to CISA. Um, this is the way that we're able to gather the information to protect the larger sector and also connected sectors. So that's one very important thing. Also, as part of uh, the White House's ICS Industrial Control System Initiative that first looked at energy, it's now looking at pipeline. So we're actually working with major companies. Uh, I was on the phone with them earlier this week about what we can do to help them shore up their security to include instantiating technology that will allow them to detect more rapidly uh, and to remediate and respond to any intrusions, one of those programs being Cyber Sentry. Uh, which we appreciate the Congress's focus on uh, permanently authorizing. Thank you, Ms. Easterly. And I share the ranking member's concerns about the complexity of this bureaucracy. Uh, recognize you're making good faith efforts every day to rationalize it and streamline, apply the right authorities through the right agencies. But um, curious, Ms. Easterly, based on your experience thus far, surely there's room for improvement. What's the most significant impediment to operational efficiency or effectiveness that you've experienced and observed in your time in this position? Uh, to be honest, Senator, uh, it has been a, a pretty good experience thus far. Uh, at the end of the day, I think CISA's role is pretty clear. We have two primary roles. We are the operational lead for federal cybersecurity, and I hope that gets formally instantiated in FISMA reform. And by statute, we're the national coordinator for critical infrastructure resilience and security. That both of those missions necessarily are team sports. It implicates partners across the federal government as well as partners across critical infrastructure. We will never own that mission wholly because, as the chairman said, over 85% is privately owned. Uh, I feel very comfortable with the partnerships that we forge to date across the federal uh, cyber ecosystem, as well as with the private sector. And as I said earlier, Senator, very excited about what we're building uh, with the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. And, and I appreciate that, Ms. Easterly. And yet there must be obstacles, inefficiencies, and impediments to effectiveness that you do encounter on a daily basis. And the Congress needs to hear them uh, because we can learn lessons about modifications to statute or reforms to policy based upon your testimony. So I, I would like to hear from you. What's not working? We need to know. 
So with respect to federal cybersecurity, I think with FISMA reform, I would ask that the Congress do three things. First, that we codify CIS's role in federal cybersecurity as the operational uh, lead, uh, that we make sure that we are holding departments and agencies specifically accountable for the investments that they make in their cybersecurity teams. They're making trade-offs every day. They need to take that seriously uh, and invest in uh, cybersecurity and give some of those authorities between OMB and NCD and make that more explicit. Uh, and finally, we need to move from this compliance and box checking to true operational risk management. I think instantiating all of that in FISMA reform will be incredibly important and helpful for our role. And finally, I do think the cyber incident notification legislation is incredibly important to establish our ability to receive reports and then share them agilely and rapidly with the rest of the community so we can raise the baseline on the cyber ecosystem. And I'm sure as I progress in this job, I may have some more things to come back to you on, Senator. Uh, in, in addition to your uh, deep experience in the Army, you've also worked in the financial services sector. Uh, how resilient and robust do you believe that sector's cybersecurity is? And uh, what changes either within the industry or at the regulatory level need to be made to protect our markets from what could be a devastating cyber attack that could lead to a financial crisis or significant economic damage? Thanks for the question. It's a great one. Uh, since 2012, when Wall Street uh, was subject to a massive distributed denial of service attack, uh, there has been significant investments made by the financial services sector, billions of dollars, to ensure that uh, there is the right process, the right technology, the right people. And that's why I think finance is generally in such uh, good shape. I think, and this is just my experience at Morgan Stanley, I think with respect to uh, regulatory regime, I always found it uh, necessary to try and harmonize that. And I think we need to think about that with respect to cyber incident reporting. I think it's very important that we're not asking uh, a company, a business that's under duress during a cyber incident to report to uh, seven different entities, whether it's CISA for cyber incidents or uh, to other regulatory uh, agencies. So the, the harmonization piece, I think, is important. But, but one other really important aspect of this, as good as finance can be, it doesn't matter if electricity isn't working, uh, if the telcos aren't working. So even as we look at these sector models, sir, we really have to look at this functionally. Right? We have to look at the national critical functions, and I think that's a very important lens because everything is interdependent, everything is connected, everything is vulnerable. And at the end of the day, that's why I think CIS's statutory role as national coordinator is so important because we have to look across the whole critical infrastructure ecosystem and make sure that it is protected as it is connected in cyberspace. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm over time. I've got a couple more questions if there's time for it later but I yield. Very good, thank you, Senator Ossoff. Senator Langford, you're recognized for your question. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you all uh, for the work that you're doing. It is uh, exceptionally important for the country and uh, grateful that you're engaging this. Uh, Mr. Inglis, let, let me walk back to something that uh, Senator Portman was talking about before on the budget issues. You have a fairly unique uh, situation here all of a sudden uh, that uh, your office requested about $15 million uh, to be able to stand up the office the infrastructure bill gave you $21 million, and then the House Appropriations Bill has allocated almost $19 million more. So you suddenly went from a $15 million request to it looks like a $40 million allocation of this. Is that what you're hearing, seeing? So my understanding is that there are um, three um, numbers. The $15 million was imagining that we would get a slow start in fiscal year 22, therefore not be able to execute at a flat high level across the whole year. Um, so therefore, you might take a $21 million figure, which is probably about the right number, and reduce that because you're not going to expend all those resources if you don't have the same number of people at the start of the year as you do at the end. Um, with respect to the other budgets, uh, my understanding is they're not additive, that, that they're going to one or the other of those will hold sway. Okay, um, that's helpful because uh, we're trying to be able to track this uh, as well uh, as you're trying to be able to stand this up. Cecilia, um, thanks again uh, for your engagement on this. Uh, obviously, after the Colonial Pipeline uh, whole incident, uh, a lot of pipeline folks uh, awakened uh, to uh, vulnerabilities that were out there uh, that has been in long-term conversation for years uh, with a lot of the pipeline companies in some areas of vulnerability on this. 
Uh, they, they made lots of hard decisions on this, but directives came out immediately that were emergency directives. What I'm hearing now from a lot of the companies, not only pipeline companies, but others saying, <clears throat> will we get to be at the table uh, when the final version is done? So help us understand what you think that would mean to, for them to be at the table, because obviously every single company is not going to be able to be there. There is a notice and comment period that allows every single entity and company to be able to contribute. But what does that look like now in the days ahead when we start getting a final ruling on this? Because there were some really good actors that had additional requirements put on them or had to redo some things, um, but they were doing all the right things already on this. So they got consequences even though they were actually doing all the right things originally. So what does this look like to be able to have more cooperation? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Some companies were doing the right thing. Some were not. Uh, I think the objective of the security directive was to set baselines, and I think that's incredibly important. Uh, as you know, we've been working with pipeline companies for many years. Uh, some of those vulnerabilities that we illuminated in the uh, security directive had not been remediated for years, and we felt it's incredibly important uh, to be able to really make aggressive uh, progress on this. So we absolutely recognize, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we're working closely with the uh, big pipeline companies. We have a task force that's been set up. Uh, I was on the phone with them earlier this week, and, and uh, understanding that there was some unhappiness from the community, I know that my colleague, uh, Administrator Pekoski, briefed them on the security directive uh, the other week, and they were quite happy with having that opportunity to consult and collaborate on the way forward. And that is absolutely my approach going forward, Senator. Everything we do has to be in partnership, uh, and I'm looking forward to furthering those uh, conversations. Be great. So how, how do we start proactively sharing intelligence information, uh, with not just with pipeline companies, with everybody in the infrastructure world, that actually has some context to it, if I can say it that way? Uh, because sometimes the different reports come out and they look so neutral that it really doesn't look like hair's on fire, do something right now. It's just a, hey, be aware of, but there's no real context to it. So how do we help provide information to people proactively to say, we're hearing this, seeing this, take action immediately on this in a way that has context to it and has some clarity to it of what to be able to do? Yeah, that's a fabulous question. You sound like me when I was at Morgan Stanley. Yeah. Um, what we wanted uh, was not just indicators, but real context. Because yep. you have to take action against something, and if it's just... Uh, um, unclear information. It doesn't help a network defender. And that's why we're so focused on timely, relevant, actionable, contextual information. We're making improvements on what's called AIS, Automated Indicator Sharing. Uh, that's a program that's been around for a while. And we actually are adding context from things like the MITRE ATT&CK network that all network defenders use to give more granular information for defense. Uh, we're also uh, looking to use CISP, which is our cyber information sharing collaboration platform, about 300 companies there, to ensure that we have re uh, regular analytic exchanges to include classified exchanges to make sure that everybody has the information they need to shore up their networks. And then finally, with respect to the JCDC, that is a way to be able to share uh, information very rapidly both within that small ecosystem and then within the larger community to help enforce across the board what companies need to do to protect themselves in cyber. So I'm optimistic about making progress, exactly as you're saying, okay. contextual. All right, that's helpful. If, if you are a, a large energy comp company, you've got lots of support on that. If you're a local co-op, you don't have the same level of support on it. So as we're communicating with these companies, how are we getting to the co-op the same as we're getting to an Edison? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I'd answer it two ways. First of all, we are constantly putting out information through our platforms. We manage CPAC, the Critical Infrastructure uh, Partnership Advisory Council, which reaches all aspects across uh, infrastructure to put out this information. We have resources, education, technical guidance, and assistance. But one of the greatest things about CISA is our field force. So we're 10 regions, 500 people across the country, security advisors that are in touch at the state and local level with some of those smaller businesses to ensure they have what they need to be able to make those changes to improve their cybersecurity baseline. Okay, that's helpful. Let me ask a, um, a question as you walk into this. Just perception at this point. Is the IC, the intelligence community, doing enough 
to be able to actually reach into areas for uh, critical infrastructure protection to, as was discussed earlier, to get left of some of these challenges, uh, to be able to make sure that we're seeing into it to see what's actually developing. We do a lot on our national security side, as we should, um, trying to be able to protect our larger systems and how we operate as well. Are there things that we can do to be able to help engage with them more to be able to raise the level of priority there? I think with respect to the Intel community in the past uh, two and a half months, I've had many engagements across the board. And I have been, as I always was when I was in government, incredibly encouraged and impressed with the power and capability of our Intel uh, community. I would say, though, Senator, with respect to some of the more exotic and sophisticated actors, uh, that take advantage of the blind spots in domestic infrastructure. We saw that with SolarWinds. We saw it with Microsoft Exchange. I don't think that that should be an icy role. I'm sure you agree with me on that. Uh, strongly, though, that's really the, the motivating uh, impetus for the JCDC. The plank holder partners are those that have incredible visibility across the ecosystem. So they are able to see into things that the government cannot and alert us to trends in malicious cyber actor behavior uh, and suspicious activity to enable us to use that information to make the ecosystem safer. I think that's how we solve the dots issue. We solve the dots issue by the visibility through our partnership construct uh, that we're building out now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Langford. Uh, Senator Scott, uh, you are recognized for your questions. Thank you, Chairman Peters. Thanks for being here. How, how important is the existing satellite system that, that our, the federal government uses to cybersecurity? And how risky do you think the exist the, the the satellite system is as far as its ability to, in any time that somebody wanted to have a conflict with this, that it would be uh, still viable? Um, appreciate the question, Senator. Um, without having the details in hand, but happy to respond to that in further detail. Would say that uh, the question is probably equally apt of how important is cybersecurity to those satellites? The satellites often perform critical functions for the nation, um, whether it's weather observations or military command and control and so on and so forth. And we need to ensure that we have invested as much in them um, as we have in any other piece of critical infrastructure. So cybersecurity is essential for them. Um, I think our adversaries would clearly hold those at risk if they thought they had the means or the ability to do so, and therefore it has to be in scope. Jen, what do you think? Uh, I would agree with that, uh, Senator, obviously. Uh, anything that is critical to our national security uh, is something that we need to make sure is protected and secure. Uh, in today's technology world, we know that uh, many things are connected and almost everything is vulnerable. It's why we work so hard to ensure that all sectors are raising their cybersecurity baseline. So very much agree with the director on this. But the way to think about it is it's more they need you to make sure that they're not um, damaged rather than the other way around. I agree. Um, so so I, I talked with um, a gentleman a couple of weeks ago, and he gave me a wonderful analogy. He says, you know why uh, race cars have bigger brakes so they can go faster, right? So, so, so the point he was making is that the reason we have cybersecurity, the reason we lay it on is not for its own sake, not so we can be proud that we've done that, but so that we can enable a mission, a critical mission. I think that's the case with satellites or any other piece of our critical infrastructure. Okay. What is, uh, what's the administration doing to go after these nation states that target our critical infrastructure? You know, if you, you know I've done, uh, I was governor of Florida, so we had all these hurricanes, uh, a lot of them. And the first thing you realize is you got to get the power back up and you got to get communication back up because you're going to eventually, if you don't get that done, you're going to run out of getting the food and, wa food and water out to everybody. So what do you think we should be doing to deal with these nation states that are targeting our critical infrastructure? critical infrastructure and essential services, and are we doing enough? So, Senator, I'll start. Uh, so I think that uh, the administration's strategy, take ransomware as an example, but, but it's not the only example where a nation state would hold us at risk. Um, there are four lines of effort currently in that strategy. One is you have to disrupt the infrastructure and the actors. Um, determine what it is they make use of and try to hold that at risk um, using all instruments of power, not simply cyber instruments of power. 
uh, but use your legal remedies, your diplomatic remedies, your financial remedies, all of that to essentially make it such that they can't succeed too. Uh, promote resilience such that we're simply a harder target. Uh, that's sometimes less satisfying because you don't see kind of some flash in the night, um, but actually if you simply avoid the event, it's far more meritorious than kind of working your way through it. Three, um, address the abuse of virtual currency, which is underpinning. It's, it's a huge fuel um, inside of this fire. Can I just, interrupt you? Do you think that's doable? I do think. I think it's doable, maybe not to the 100th percentile, but, but I do think it's doable. Okay. Right, so the sanctioning that occurred, uh, what, two days ago of uh, QX or MUX, which um, has shown itself to be involved in so many of these transactions of virtual currency turning into hard currency or vice versa. But we can essentially kind of lock those down if we know that they're um, um, engaged in illicit activities um, and, and actually try to hold the virtual system accountable for the same requirements that the hard currency system does. Um, and, and then finally, I think that the fourth element, um, not independent of the other three, is to do this in the broadest possible coalition. This is an international issue, not a U.S. only issue. And so we need to, if we're bringing pressure to bear on Vladimir Putin because he gives sanctuary or permissive action, we need to bring a coalition to bear to hold him at risk, to determine what it is he cares about, to use all of our powers across nations who have the same problem, who are like-minded in their desire to achieve uh, the outcomes in this space. You want to add anything? I, I think it's a great rundown. I mean, this really is a whole of nation effort where CIS's role, of course, is in that promoting resilience space. We also do response and recovery. But uh, I'd be failing if I didn't take this opportunity to just say uh, that, yes, there are sophisticated and, and uh, highly dedicated actors, sir. But much of the attacks that we see could be prevented with good cyber hygiene. And so incredibly important that all uh, entities do the basics to include, most importantly, in my view, implementing multi-factor authentication. And we're going to spend Cybersecurity Awareness Month uh, in October making sure that everybody has what they need to implement the basics. Okay. Sir, if I might jump back in, um, just to compliment Jen on this, uh, if you go to stopransomware.gov, a, a, a site set up by CISA, you actually learn quite a lot about how you can actually be your own best defense. Did you want to add anything? No, sir, I think that uh, it's well stated by my colleagues. The only thing I would say is, you know, as the lead for federal civilian, um, we take an approach of anything of value is going to be a high target. So we have a high value asset approach. And then we prioritize our efforts around looking at the threats and vulnerabilities of those assets first. So that aligns completely with the concerns you've raised and been expressed here. Good. According to the U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence 2021 Annual Threat Assessment, China presents a prolific and effective cyber espionage threat, possesses substantial cyber attack capabilities, and presents a growing influence threat. I think everybody pretty much agree with that. Um, can you describe some of the risk we face um, when it comes to cyber attacks from, as just, I mean, let's just pick on one. I'd pick on Communist China. Uh, Sir, I can. Um, you know, I, I'll try to go fast since I think we, we know all of this. Um, it's just a summary of what I think is already out there. Um, first and foremost, um, you know, th there's a theft of intellectual property that constitutes hard-won um, competitive advantage of our businesses, our industries. Um, to aid and abet, right, the development of their own industries. Uh, that's simply wrong, um, and, and it's an unlevel playing field that we need to challenge. Uh, second, um, kind of stealing some of that material, uh, those secrets, um, they can hold our maneuvers, our actions at risk, our legitimate actions in the realm of diplomacy or military actions hold that at risk in ways that are inappropriate. Finally, they can attack our confidence by not by making it such that we might come to the conclusion that this digital infrastructure won't work for us when and, and as it should, um, and that perhaps is the most insidious, pernicious threat of all. Um, the answer to all of those. I think that's those, true, right? Don't you think most people believe it won't be there if they, if, at, at, when we need it? Our job is to, I, I, I think it's possibly true. Um, yeah. I, I think it's our job to ensure that we have sufficient confidence. I, I think that we can, can agree that the infrastructure that we make use of can never be perfectly secure and yeah. it won't defend itself. So we can make it defensible. Jen has described many ways to do that. We then must actually defend it. Um, and we must have a transcendent, resilient idea of who we are and where we're going such that that's the thing that they have to challenge, um, such that we um, essentially um, achieve our aspirations through momentum um, as much or more as through knocking down right, the efforts that somebody else undertakes to hold that at risk. I don't think I could say it better. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thanks. Thank you, uh, Senator Scott. Uh, Ranking Portman, I know you have a, a question that you'd like to ask. You're recognized for it. Yeah, thank you. And again, thanks for the uh, the opportunity today to dig into some of these issues, including uh, the good dialogue you just had with Senator Scott. There's there's so much um, that needs to be done to tighten up our defenses and respond more effectively. But one is this reporting requirements uh, legislation we talked about earlier, and we would like to get uh, legislation passed that is bipartisan that you all uh, can work with. And and the bottom line is it would require entities to report to you, Ms. Easterly, um, in a more um, expedited fashion and in, a, and, and in some cases just clarifying that that's a responsibility because it's not, as we saw with uh, Colonial Pipelines when they got to the FBI and, and didn't contact you based on our hearing testimony. So for you to be able to properly disseminate that information that you get to the right agencies uh, and therefore to have the right analysis, I suppose you need to do that. What do you need? In other words, if we have a reporting requirement, what do you need to make it effective so that CISA can take that information and get it out immediately to the right actors? Thanks for the question, Senator. Uh, well, that's what we do every day. Uh, we uh, receive a variety of reports uh, across the federal civilian executive branch. We receive a variety of reports at the state and local level, and then, of course, at critical infrastructure. And we analyze those reports to ensure that if there is information that needs to be shared with other entities uh, to help us raise the cybersecurity baseline uh, of the cyber ecosystem, that we are doing that. That really is what I describe as our superpower, is to share that information. And the authorities that we were given by the Congress to do that, I think, are uh, exactly what we need. What we, if, if this legislation goes into place, and I'm a huge supporter of it, and I think, as I said earlier, uh, we need to craft it in such a way uh, that it enables enforcement, it is uh, timely, but we're going to need to put in a place process to be able to handle this information at even greater scale and make sure that we can share it as agilely as possible. I think that the JCDC that we're standing up will help enable that because, again, that gives a construct to share many to many. Uniquely, it is the only federal cyber entity in statute that brings together NSA, FBI, CISA, Cybercom, DOD, ODNI with the private sector so that we can share that many to many. That's the dots uh, visibility issue that we're trying to solve, Ranking Member Portman, and I'm optimistic that we'll be able to, to leverage uh, any new legislation to share that information as agilely as possible. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, my colleagues um, want to ask some additional questions. I want to make sure they get the chance to. We'll have more follow-up on this as we move the legislation um, through the process, but we want your input. We want to make sure that this works right and doesn't unduly burden uh, those who get hacked at a time when they have to be able to respond. So that's why there's a time period here um, to give them time where they're not filling out paperwork, but they're in fact um, you know, addressing the attack. So there's a balance there, we understand that. But ultimately we wanna have a reporting requirement and we wanna make sure that you have the resources to be able to properly take that information and get it out to the right uh, federal agencies and others as quickly as possible. Can I respond to that? Yes. I totally agree with you. I mean, we went through this in the private sector at Morgan Stanley. What we don't want is to have CISA overburdened with erroneous reporting, and we don't want to burden a company under duress when they're trying to actually manage a live incident. And that's why I think the rulemaking process that will be consultative with industry will really be important to getting this right. We don't want to be flooded uh, with reports saying we, we detected something, we're not sure whether there's actual impact or not, I think we need to make sure that there's determined impact and then we can get that information and we can do something with it that will help ensure the cybersecurity baseline is raised. Uh, but erroneous noise is not what we need. We need signal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You, you noted that at the outset we introduced into the record uh, letters we've received from the private sector. And I think you'll see in some of that information uh, the input that you're talking about. And uh, it's a balance, and, and we'll try to achieve that balance, but also provide some discretion so that we get it right. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Parman. Senator Ossoff, um, if you have an additional question or two, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know time is short and there's a vote on the floor, so two final questions for you, please, Mr. Inglis. The first is what do we all need to do as public leaders, 
what would we call upon the private sector to do to build a privacy culture in this country such that citizens understand the risks associated with engagement online with the use of technology so that basic cyber hygiene principles, practices like patching and using complex passwords and uh, preferring encrypted messaging apps, uh, avoiding reckless public disclosure that can put one at risk or one's family at risk or invite uh, financial intrusion. Um, what, what can we all do to make that uh, something that is closer to our core understanding of citizenship? So, Senator, thank you for that terrific question. I, I would say um, many things. Um, first, I would say um, follow the best examples of this committee in two key ways. Um, one, this is by every um, kind of representation a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue. Right? You, 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 you all speak with equal fervor about the nature of what this means to us and what we should do about that. That's, um, that's, that's extraordinarily important, too. Um, you've taken it seriously such that you've asked us questions. You demand that we give you good answers. We'll continue to work our way through that. This is an issue that all of us have as a responsibility, not simply the people who have IT or cyber in their name. Three, um, to the point that you've mentioned some things that people should know, regardless of whether they're Python coders or IT experts, um, I think that we assume too much about people raised in the midst of technology, that they're digital natives. They're generally not. They're app natives. But they understand how to use this stuff. They have no idea about what the security consequences are. And in as much as we teach our children how to walk across a busy street, especially when they're in an environment where perhaps the traffic goes the wrong way, we need to spend an equal amount of time teaching them something about the basics of cyberspace, how that works, what happens when you touch a link, um, what perhaps are the responsibility, who's defending your stuff when you store it in whatever the cloud is. We need to tell them a little bit more about that. Those are basic fundamental issues. Finally, I would say that we need to um, redouble our efforts to, in, to imbue critical thinking in our people because we can't predict all of the situations they're going to encounter. They therefore need to have um, foundational abilities to say, does this make sense? Um, and make a choice based upon some facts that are kind of solid underneath them. I think we do all of those things, we're in a better place. Thank you, Mr. Inglis, and let's continue the conversation on this subject. My final question, and it's a brief one, Mr. Chairman, for you, Mr. Inglis, in your capacity, you have to consume threat intelligence, work with the intelligence community, work with law enforcement agencies. You've got a background at the National Security Agency. What is your involvement, if any, um, with respect to policy decisions, operational decisions, legal interpretation that touches on intelligence collection that may be related to or include collection of data, information, or anything pertaining to U.S. persons? Uh, Senator, as you indicate, I am an avid consumer of that, not simply for my own sake, so that on behalf of those I represent, um, the institutions that are charged with cyber defense, that we can be properly informed about the true nature of threat. Um, that would, in turn, have an effect on what they then attempt to collect and how they then produce that. But I am not um, able to direct that um, with a hands-on um, ability as appropriate to my limited responsibilities with respect to offensive or intelligence capabilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Ossoff. Uh, I have um, a couple, couple final questions here uh, for, for the uh, the panel, but I'll start uh, with Mr. Inglis on this question. And, and I think all of you know we're, right now we're in the middle of an investigation into the uh, Kaseya hack, so I know you'll be limited as to, to what you can say. But I think this committee uh, needs uh, to understand, particularly with some of the information that came to light just recently regarding uh, the FBI's action, that we need to understand how the administration balances the need for investigating a, a cyber attack uh, and providing relief uh, to the victims uh, as well. So as, as National Cyber Director, could you explain the process that the government uses to evaluate uh, investigative needs compared to assisting victims in attacks and you coordinate with the FBI? Give us a, a, a better picture of how this uh, happens. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, first, I would say that the overwhelming bias is to assist the American people, right, to, to essentially uh, provide um, the government's resources and, and its focus, its time and attention to assist them, um, as opposed to develop um, for its own sake um, some instrument of power for its own sake. Um, the article the other day that probably showed up first in the Washington Post had a headline 
uh, that indicated that there potentially was an undue delay in the kind of provision of the key. But when you read the article, uh, the article itself actually, I think, thoughtfully said that there was, in fact, a very strong focus on how do we help Kaseya, how do we help the downstream or upstream customers. Um, and that challenge, um, which is the first and foremost priority, um, often takes into has to take into consideration um, how can we do this in a way that's at once timely and has the most, um, has this most significant impact. Um, and, and those two things, sometimes when you align them, um, you wind up not trading one for the other, but not achieving an optimal effect on, on both of them at the same time. Um, but I would just say that the government starts with how do we actually assist the private sector in the most impactful way? Um, how do we then use all the instruments at our disposal to do that? Um, and how do we then have a full-fledged discussion across those instruments of power in as timely a way as possible to come up with the strategy, the plan? Um, I'll defer to Jen for the rest of the answer. Ms. Easterly? Uh, yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, obviously I was not here during those discussions. Uh, certainly having, having managed uh, live incidents in real time, it's a very complex process, and certainly there are competing goals around uh, doing what you can for current victims and then potentially, and then protecting potential victims. Uh, wh what I would say is I would expect to be part of any of those discussions going forward, and at CISA, what I would do would be advocating uh, for doing everything that we can to ensure that uh, victims have the tools that they need to recover, remediate, and get their businesses back up and running, and that we have the information that we need to protect future victims, why your cyber incident uh, legislation is so important. Mr. Russia, the final, we'll do the final question for, for, for you. We've, we've been discussing um, some of the legislation that we're working on here in the committee to reform uh, FISMA. Uh, and we've heard from the, the other witnesses re, some uh, good input related to that. I wanted to give you an opportunity to suggest any reforms that you think are needed uh, to FISMA to protect our, our federal networks. Yeah, absolutely, Senator, and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, as you know, we're working closely with your uh, committee staff uh, on, on the bill, and we're excited about that opportunity. Um, yeah, you know, Director Eastley has stated a lot of our priorities already, um, but I would reiterate that, that clarifying roles and responsibilities is crucial, and we're, we're committed to that. Really moving towards uh, tested security, away from attested security, so that we can determine uh, through continuous monitoring and testing where the greatest risks are and address those first, and having supportive legislation of that. Uh, having legislation that ensures that um, we're not uh, being overly burdensome with, with multiple uh, compliance requirements and regimes that are going towards agencies and so that we can streamline some of that and maybe provide some relief on um, how often they need to do that so they can focus on remediating the vulnerabilities that they're finding through tests and mechanisms and also moving towards automation. You know, there is a skills gap in this, in this space. We're working to address it, but we can't do that fast enough and so we've got to lean on uh, the technology and integrate that into our processes. And so I think those priorities are, are well aligned and shared, um, and we just look forward to uh, the right language to codify those as well. Well, thank you for that answer. And uh, once again, thank you uh, to our, our witnesses uh, for joining us uh, today. I appreciate uh, all of your efforts to, to strengthen uh, our cybersecurity defenses. It's a big challenge. All three of you are certainly uh, up to that challenge. And I appreciate you taking the time today to discuss uh, these issues with the committee. I think you can tell this committee is very focused on these issues. All of the members are very engaged. We understand the seriousness of what we're dealing with, and we want to support you uh, in your efforts each and every day. Uh, we have to stay vigilant against these uh, breaches and ransomware attacks, and effectively addressing these uh, is going to require uh, strong coordination uh, between uh, our offices and, and work in a bipartisan way. Uh, I look forward to working with uh, continuing my work with Ranking Member Portman to introduce bills that will strengthen the cyber incident and ransom payment reporting requirements for key public and private sector entities and ensure that uh, federal government uh, networks are also prepared to deal with these evolving threats. I think we heard today that there's a, a clear need uh, for our offices to get this information, uh, which can help uh, you connect the dots and, and who's behind these attacks and help prevent potential targets from being potential victims. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you and with my colleagues on this committee to do everything in our power to, to strengthen our cybersecurity defenses. Uh, the record for this hearing uh, will remain open for 15 days uh, until 5 p.m. on October 8th of 2021 for the submission of statements